I live amongst 76 million artists. I left Iran at the age of 15 and lived in the United States for 40 years <clears throat> and came back four years ago when my mother passed away. I came back to comfort my father and <clears throat> realized that I was going to get a lot more from this tragedy in my life. Arrival at the Tehran's airport was probably one of the most anxious times I can remember, other than the birth of my children. Uh, here everybody spoke Farsi. And you could see this arrival area divided by a glass wall, where on the other side there were people who were waiting to greet their loved ones, their friends, all carrying bouquets of flowers. And as we were coming out of the customs area, you could hear them hand the flower bouquets to their friends, and you could hear the whispers of, may your life be, not be like a flower. And I thought, how sweet it is, this Farsi, as we say, it is sugar. Sugar to the ears and sugar to the soul. On the drive back from the airport, um, the taxi driver uh, reminded me of how lucky I was because I could see the Damavan Mountains and that uh, it was a clear day with no pollutions. That's why I was lucky. And I looked and it is quite amazing. It's a grand old mountain, always white cap. Um, but it plays such an important role in the psyche of most Iranians. The myth goes that Arash, the archer, climbed this mountain and from the peak he threw arrows in four directions to set the boundaries of the land so that the neighbors wouldn't have a war. And with the last arrow, he gave his life, sending that the furthest. It landed on the shores of the Persian Gulf here. And I loved that story from my childhood days. And in fact, I named my son Arash with that myth in mind. <clears throat> my time in Tehran was mostly spent walking around. I was looking for memory trigger points so that I could remember things from 40 years back. And unfortunately, there weren't that many. Tehran is a city of contrasts, as most of Iran is. Contrast between very old, modern, new, very new. <clears throat> you could see dilapidated buildings, and you could see very modern structures pretty much along the same street. Tehran <clears throat> showed a part of itself to me that I had not expected. Iran is a land that has been trying and has successfully done so, fighting deserts uh, for, forever, I believe, for centuries and forever. We have figured very smart ways to fight back, to reclaim it and to take water. <clears throat> and this struggle goes on today. Iran and Tehran especially, is a city of contradictions and contrasts. In my walks, I would find musicians playing in the corners of the street, in the buses, in the metro, and my friends would tell me that, um, you know, for a musician to get a permit to play in a hall, you would have to wait potentially up to a year. I thought it was how interesting that you could play at any corner at any time you wanted to. Iran is a city of flowers. Our culture has such reverence for flowers. <clears throat> and you can see the florists and the flower shops at the corner of streets, almost every other street, in almost every city that you go to in Iran. <clears throat> the contrast with the busyness of a traffic and the serenity and peacefulness of Persian homes reminded me of some of my fondest memories about Iran. <clears throat> the time that I spent at my grandmother's home. My grandmother was a sweet old lady we called Aziz, which means dear one. And she would serve her meals on a floor on a white tablecloth laid over a carpet. She had a dining room set. 
She never used it. It was her way of making sure that her family is connected together. I remember in her house there was a Mina pottery copper work. There was a miniature. There were two books of poetry and a Quran, a book of poetry from Hafiz and a book of poetry from Rumi. But interestingly enough, she was illiterate, and she would recite poems of Baba Tahir or Yan, who's a vagabond poet of Iran. <clears throat> On my return, I realized that that set of artifacts and pieces of artwork are pretty much present in everybody's home in Iran. And the questions started to come up: How is it? In a country as vast as Iran, from the mountains in the north to the deserts in the south, from west to east, we have the same artwork with different designs, but the same utility. We have the same carpets with different colorings reflecting nature and the resources of that locality, but its utility is pretty much the same. These questions <clears throat> kept coming up, and I really didn't have an answer as to how is this possible. Now, for those of you who may have read a little bit about the history of Iran, you will know that in the past 7,000 years, uh, 3,000 years of it, that it has been an empire. It has been attacked some 32 times. It has been conquered five times. And I started to think of how this would impact the lives of people in Iran. I guess I was a foreigner in my own homeland. I was observing things that usually you would not. Um, <clears throat> in my walks, I would ask this question. I talked to people. I talked to grocery store guys, I talked to the bus drivers, I talked to the tow truck drivers, I talked to the florists, I talked to the sweepers, and <clears throat> I wanted to figure out what is it that has this seamless culture amongst people who are made up of 13 different distinct ethnic groups. 13 different distinct ethnic groups. And <clears throat> One day I was thinking, and I remembered something that I read by Marshall McLuhan in his famous essay about the medium being the message. In that section that sort of jumped out at me, and I have here up on the screen for you, <clears throat> he basically asks a question which I think is relevant today. All I did in, that, in this paragraph, in my mind, I replaced the word next technology with the next invader. And voila, it all started to make sense. We had used artists and artisans as navigators, as people who would show the way going forward. That's why our art is the same throughout this vast land. That's why you could see how we've dealt with the elements pretty much in the same pattern, in the same way. So have we figured out 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, by having 1,000 poets communicating their art in a coded way to help us navigate the future? to help us navigate this phenomenal level of change that we are facing? I think we had. Let me share a little bit of that with you. We were attacked by Alexander, the Phoenicians, the <coughs> Greeks, Macedonians, and his generals became the rulers of Iran and ruled for 200 years. By the end of 200 years, they spoke Persian, or Pahlavi, the language of the time, I believe, and the mannerism of their court was Persian. 600 years later, we helped them translate their books from Greek to Latin and Hebrew. 
We were conquered by Arab invaders and forced to change our alphabet to Arabic. And we did, but we do not speak Arabic. We did and we contributed some of the most important grammar and poetry literature to Arabic literature. We were told that we cannot paint, you cannot have engraven images. So we came up with a new way to show that part of our creativity. We came up with calligraphy. <clears throat> the contributions that the Persians and the Iranians have made to the Arabic literature and poetry have been documented extensively. We were invaded by Mongol invaders. And we were still bound by the rules of no graven images. So we came up with a new style of painting that painted beings that represented in a very surreal way the real beings, but not really the real beings. We call it miniature. So you could see people, but you would never find one like them. You could see a deer or a horse, but you would never find a deer or a horse looking like a miniature painting. <clears throat> and this list goes on and on and on. So, from my perspective, I started to put these pieces together and realized that we had in fact figured a code. The code was to communicate through creativity, beauty, and that beauty, in fact, was the most effective way to overcome hardship. We were trained, we were taught by parents, by grandmothers, to appreciate art not as something you would put in museums, but something that you live with. And I think this beautiful code that has been transmitted in this, in this culture for at least 3,000 years continues to thrive. We continue to be people who have survived, not through the fittest mechanism, as Darwinism and the West would like you to believe, but we've survived through the most creative way, through the most artistic way. That realization was enough for me to realize that my mother, by passing away, had given me a new gift of life, realizing that I live amongst 76 million artists. And I would invite all of you, as friends who've come from overseas, to experience living amongst 76 million artists. Thank you.